Thamesmead is one of the most controversial housing developments in Europe. It was conceived in the 1950s as a grand solution to many of London's social problems. When the first phase opened in the late 60s, it was hailed as the town of the 21st century. Unfortunately, now that we're in the 21st century, many people just look at Thamesmead as a mistake from the 1960s. But the history is not so cut and dry. The town that stands today bears little relation to the original master plan. Rather than being a grand, cohesive development, it's a mishmash of styles and ideas that in some way reflect the way the country has changed over the last 40 years. Thamesmead is now home to people from a wide range of communities and backgrounds who have moved here at different times. And inevitably their opinions about the town vary wildly. How will they react to seeing lost films from the early days of Thamesmead? And what will they make of the utopian vision that resulted in this 21st century town? The Victorian streets of Clerkenwell are home to the London Metropolitan Archives. It's an expansive building that holds the city's records of births, deaths and marriages alongside a huge number of historical documents. Beyond the public research and reading rooms, a large team of specialist archivists and conservators work with the LMA's collections, cataloguing and conserving these precious artefacts. The collection contains everything from books and documents to photographs, videos and films. The films that we have here are quite wide and varied and they cover everything from private companies like Lines and Tetley and Chubb to charities and organisations who have deposited their records here. One of the collections we have here is the GLC collection which is the films and videos that were made by the Greater London Council to basically show off about what the GLC did for Londoners. We have everything from general films about the various services the GLC provided to actually specific departments and what sort of things they were doing for Londoners at the time. Many of the films that the GLC produced focused on the city's housing situation, which had been in a terrible state since the end of the war. The destruction and damage caused by bombing raids had diminished housing stock forcing Londoners to live in overcrowded slums. And with the baby boom, there had been a surge in demand for new homes. The GLC was building temporary housing and new estates, but they weren't having enough impact. This was the era of new town construction, so the GLC produced an ambitious plan to create its own new town, using an area of disused land on the south bank of the Thames. It was wanting somewhere for London's population to move to that was within close distance to where they were moving from. And it was that issue of the size, the actual scale of what they were proposing to do, which was unlike anything they'd done before within a metropolitan area. In 1967, the GLC produced a master plan that outlined what Thamesmead would look like in the early 80s, its anticipated completion date. It was an incredible master plan. It looked fantastic. It was going to include provision for working, shopping, commercial facilities, leisure facilities. Everything was going to be included in this community. The master plan included elements that went way beyond the scope of most London developments that had come before it and since. They were planning to do a, a big commercial development along the riverside, which would have included a marina that looks like something out of the Mediterranean. It was anticipating something that was going to be so futuristic, really, that they were going to achieve now, for people now. To promote the new town, the GLC sought the services of Tara Films, run by husband and wife team Jack and Charmian Saywood. My husband had been in the advertising industry. He felt he wanted to make documentary films. They made a variety of films largely about social issues, including films for the Inner London Education Authority and what was then known as the National Society for Mentally Handicapped Children. There must be many who, through lack of understanding and uncertainty about what to expect, would withdraw from the mentally handicapped. 
The first film about Thamesmead was called Thamesmead 1968, which was updated in 1970 and renamed, unsurprisingly, Thamesmead 1970. The film follows the design and building process of the first phase of the town, all the way through to residents moving in. Jack had a weakness for old cars, and at this point he, he found an old Rolls Royce, a Sedanka de Ville actually, with the roof that came back, and you know, you opened the door and spoke to the chauffeur through the, with the glass. And that's how I, we journeyed to Thamesmead from northwest London, you know, every day for weeks and weeks. At County Hall 2, headquarters of the GLC, the work goes on. Discussion, research, consultation at all levels, revisions, adjustments, improvements to plans and models. I was very excited by the excitement of the architects and the ideas of all they were going to do, especially the idea that if you build big flats for lots of people and have houses for people who Let's face it, can afford them because the houses are going to be more expensive than the flats. Then you will have a real community. By the beginning of October 1969, the first tower block was completed. At the opening ceremony, the building, in which there are 48 flats, was formally handed over by the building contractors to the Greater London Council. The film was shown widely since the new town was seen as a flagship development for London and had met great interest internationally. Indeed, from the top of the block, you can turn from 19th century development to 21st century development. Here However, before long, the sheen of Thamesmead was tarnished. There were no shops and very few transport links. The flats had grave problems with water leakage. Violence and vandalism were rising, as was depression amongst the residents. And the press backlash was unstoppable. In 1974, the GLC went back to Tara Films with a new commission. Having done the, the first one, showing the building of it, then they wanted to show what it was like living there and how, how well it was all going and how wonderful it was. Living at Thamesmead was a highly unusual film for the GLC. It's a semi-dramatized story about a young couple in the new town. Its stars were both well known. Judy Dawn Cole had played one of the leads alongside Gene Wilder in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, while Spencer Banks was the teen star of the sci-fi drama series, Time Slip. Tom, about time too. Oh, I'm sorry, Sal. Ever so sorry. Anyway, there's no hurry. We've got all afternoon. That's not the point. When he'd... Um, you know, got the idea of what it was all going to be about. He got a bit desperate about it just being endless shots of buildings and, you know, skyscrapers. So he thought quite early on that it would give it a bit of life to, to have this young couple to enable you to get around to different places without it just being panning with the, with the camera, you know. The impression of haste is accentuated by increased speed with which the film is cut. They pass the camera, they approach the camera, move, they move away from the camera. Each time these brief shots are building up an impression of the layout and appearance of the residential areas. The way trees are growing in the little squares, the gardens and splashes of green. They will be shot from odd angles, often from almost ground level, looking up at the two as they pass. During the course of their walk around Thamesmead, the young couple reflect on what they like most about the town. The town show, the football team, church, childcare, nightlife, school, healthcare, a local newspaper, nice nature trails, job opportunities and friendly neighbours. It stops just short of being a pure propaganda piece when it acknowledges some of the shortfalls of the new town. It even includes a scene in one of the community groups which were very active in changing the town in the early years. Because what we've got to remember is that the nearest post office is at least half a mile away. However, by the end, there can be only one thing that this pair want in life. Come on! Hello, what can I do for you two? A close shot of each head from her angle shows each of them looking a little bashful and awkward. 
I've got this good job down on the estate, haven't I? Yes, and I'll be able to get a job down there too. So why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't you what? Sally, suddenly courageous, almost aggressive, faces straight into the camera. Put our names down for a flat in Thamesmead. That's what. Sit down. In the years since their initial release, Living at Thamesmead and Thamesmead 1970 have rarely been watched. Now, the films have been dusted down and tidied up, ready for a series of screenings in a variety of community venues in the town where they were shot. The person responsible for presenting them to a modern audience is Paul Sherrard, an interpretation officer at the London Metropolitan Archives. Interpretation officer means taking documents, texts, pictures, films, photographs, and kind of trying to unlock the stories that are in them um, and interpreting those stories like for and with members of the public. Using skills in theatre and creative writing, Paul usually works with documents and photographs from the archives, not the film and video collection. This project is going to be a new thing for me um, and um, I'm sure it's going to be um, interesting finding out the realities of hosting community screenings. The first screening is at the Trust Thamesmead Summer Festival. This is a big family day out that has taken place annually since the early days of the town and has become an institution. To show the films, a cinema tent has been constructed specially for the day. My biggest fear for today is that people don't come to see the film because this is a, an exciting festival, there's lots going on. The crowds at the festival have plenty of other attractions that they could go to see instead of this programme of historical films. Local groups perform on the community stages, while the main stage features Queen and Frank Sinatra tributes and a performance from Laura White from last year's X Factor. Paul and Lydia go out to try and encourage people to come along. I offer you an invitation to a free film screening at one o'clock next door. Our film screening is at one o'clock. From like when Thamesmead was first being built, so yeah, from the late yeah, 60s, yeah, early yeah. 70s. TV adverts, kind of a new town on an old marsh kind of thing. Hey, uh, we're having free films, free popcorn oh, yeah, no, over I'm, in this town here. I'm really interested. Oh, brilliant. This is, uh, my route. We'd like to come to our free film screenings about Thamesmead, the life around here. Yeah. Uh, how do you change it? What? Well, yeah. You change you it? You change it with all these people driving their lives around my road, knocking kids over. Five you can't, let kids out. You can't let you kids out. Paul needn't have worried. For two screenings, the cinema tent is full. People are sitting on the floor and standing to watch the films. We're going to be showing these films and getting your reaction to these films, telling us what you think of life in Thamesmead now and what these films, what kind of memories they may have evoked about. Um, what Thames Mead was once like. For 60,000 Londoners and started work with the two London Borough Councils. For many people, the films bring back fond memories. I used to come to Thames Mead to, when it was all marshlands and uh, I used to have a friend who used to, we used to come down here to go fishing. Seeing how Thames Mead was then compared to it is now, it's just an amazing experience. And seeing people I used to know from back then, also old teachers and my school as well. There was one point in the three generations of one family sitting, talking to each other and pointing at stuff in the film. And I was looking at that thinking, that snapshot there is kind of exactly why I wanted to do this project. She was really working hard with that broom, wasn't she? As the afternoon progresses, the films evoke a general feel of nostalgia for the optimism of the master plans and the rose-tinted vision of the early days. Yes, Sal, do you fancy chocolate ice? Oh, yes, please. Ice cream, if you'll pay it. I might have known there's a catch in it. But for some, this brings on a feeling of regret. It's a whole new place, everything's new, and you've got involved with all the community and the people were nice. You used to talk to your next door neighbour and going for cups of tea and that. You could look forward to the afternoon, get my work done, and then take the children out and let them play in the paddling pole and the swings and everything. I 
used to take my bikes down there. <laughs> and it's gone, like, you know, where's it gone? The children haven't got that anymore. There's nothing there for the children. A few people I spoke to were genuinely depressed or sad by the sort of ideal town that had suffered, especially over like the last 20 years. And they've had their own theories as to why that was. Um, and so I've got a lot in my head from that today, and it's going to affect how I approach the next screenings, I think. Fifty years ago, the land that Thamesmead now stands on was a peat marsh 20 feet deep. It may not have been the obvious choice to build a new town on. According to the records, the land came quite cheap to the GLC, but I think what they didn't realise was the problems that were associated with it. The land was described as being like a sponge, it was full of water, and you couldn't build anything on it because it sunk. They had to dig piles before anything could be constructed, the roads, the drains, everything, and they talked about at one point where they'd put the piles in and by the time they came back to, to construct on top of them, the piles had disappeared because they'd sunk. The soft land was not the only challenge. The ground had been contaminated by the factories that built munitions on the site. The air was polluted by the neighbouring sewage works and power stations. And the whole area was at risk of flooding. The planners had to produce solutions to all of these problems before they could even consider that people could live on the land. And some of the solutions were extremely inventive. The area had flooded in the past, so there was a, a building regulation that said everything had to, every habitable dwelling had to be at first floor level, so they couldn't build anything on the ground. As a way of tackling that, they decided that they would put on the ground all the underground parking and all the roads, but they would put these elevated walkways that would connect to all the habitable levels and the shops, so that there was a, a segregation of the cars and the people. And the idea was that you could walk all around Thamesmead without confronting any cars. Walkways above the level of the roads will bridge traffic routes and link the whole area of Thamesmead to the town centre. The GLC had built a new town that was unlike anything that anyone had seen before. Well, this is where I actually moved into in 1970, just down the bottom of the end. They've taken away some of these bridges here, and the, the, the actual wall cups of the bridge going over to the shops. And that's what they was all like. And it was fascinating for us as kids, five years of age, coming here. It was like a slide in the adventure playground. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Barry Stokely has lived in Thamesmead since he was five years old. While he doesn't appear in the GLC films, he was captured in a series of publicity photos that the GLC shot. We offered him a chance to watch the films, and he invited another long-term resident, John Gooch, to join him. Quite humble to think that we're still here. Uh, quite fortunate to be one of the chosen families in the early 60s, or late 60s rather. And quite lucky to have met a lot of good people around the area, and still here now. Yeah, good friends, still here. People you can count on, it's nice. Mm, definitely you can count on. I'm just quite, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, I'm quite happy here. John is one of the few people who can claim to have lived in Thamesmead longer than Barry. His family were Thamesmead's first residents, moving into their flat in Coraline Walk in 1968. Their symbolic arrival was met with wide press coverage, and it wasn't too long before Jack and Charmy and Sayward were filming them for Thamesmead 1970. Unbelievable. That's where, that's where you lived. Yeah. <laughs> Coming out there. Yeah. Last one. There was someone out of that one. There you are. You didn't hear something. It's the first family to move into a five roomed maisonette on top of the old mum here, look. The old mum. Mrs. Gooch has a patio. It's strange seeing my mum, you know, she's been gone for nine yeah. years. And that was the highlight of the film for me, I've got to be honest. Yeah, that must be the nice Yeah, I can understand that. She has a modern kitchen adjoining a big lounge. For the first time, her daughter and her two boys have separate rooms and a study where they can study. all do their housework. <laughs> <laughs> her daughter now. Look, that's has what I've done my thesis. Do you study? 
Uh, Mrs. Gooch, uh, it would be wrong to move her from her bed <coughs> where she was very happy and doing well. John's father has never moved from that original flat, but then why should he? The flat was the best built in the whole town. They had to go to great lengths to make sure that that first flat didn't have any problems with it, but then they couldn't move any other people in for, I believe it was about nine months before they felt confident that the other flats were all ready for the uh, inhabitants to move in. So I think that first family lived there for quite a number of months, all on their own, <laughs> which must have been extraordinary. <laughs> Eventually, the community began to grow as the Gooches were joined by new neighbours. And the building continued relentlessly. They wanted to build fast. It was, I'm told, like a, a sort of Lego construction. They would cook the panels in the factory, suspend them to dry out, and then transport them on lorries to the site where they were assembled. The whole area developed from this desolate landscape to this striking, striking visual image with these tall blocks coming out of the ground. For the children of the early families, the town was great fun. Imagine the size of that plant when you're five years old. <laughs> and as if building sites weren't dangerous enough for the Thamesmead children, they still had the remains of the Second World War munitions factories to explore. Here, for over 300 years, the Royal Arsenal has been a reserve for the manufacture, development and storing of weapons. Let's go out of the Arsenal. <laughs> Pushing this one open the oh, door, mate. Run! <laughs> oh, run it through, lady, you run it. You've done a white, you run it up there. just like, it was like, must have been like the train. You were wading through bullets on the floor, wasn't it? Oh, it was like two-two rifle bullets. Thousands of yeah, thousands of but it was clear that the children needed something safe and fun to do. In 1970, a group of residents set up a football team for the town. The amount of time I've been living here, this has been here 20 years now, they've never knew where it was. Yeah, I know, because you had to party, because the season come over, didn't I? Yeah. Obviously, this was, put, this was the guys who, who achieved this all, uh, like I say, you made it Terry Glock. You know, what an achievement they done in their day. Barry yeah. played for the club when he was a child, and nowadays, he's the chairman. Going for the community. He helped us arrange a screening of the films for the club's supporters. It looks a lot better inside, honestly. Now, if you've lived in Thamesmead a long time, you'll know that films are always being made about the town because it was this very exciting 21st century town. We thought people who actually live here would be interested to see what it looked like 30, 40 years ago or when they were first building it. With the rest of the world, this was the view that they had of Thamesmead. <laughs> The needs and pleasures of children and young people are a priority at County Hall and in the two boroughs. Education, recreation, sports and children's play. In Thamesmead 1970, there are sections of footage that were shot elsewhere to demonstrate what Thamesmead would be like. Many of those never came about. For some of the football club audience, any sense of nostalgia is overwhelmed by resentment about broken promises and a lack of facilities. The vision, yeah. the vision was great. Yeah. Unfortunately, never materialised, mm. and it didn't. And that's the sad part. Yeah, like the river crossing and all that. Everything sort of thing. they anticipated would happen never happened. The Thames Street Town Centre wasn't built for years and years after they promised, so that was quite. Yeah. It's quite difficult. By the time living at Thamesmead was made, three years of constant community action had created institutions, organisations, support networks and even this football club. Jack and Charmian Saywood highlighted the community involvement by casting all of the actors except for the two leads from the most active members of the Tenants Association and developing their story accordingly. Two of the stars of Living at Thamesmead came to see the film at Thamesmead Town Football Club. In the film, Spencer Banks plays Tom Aidy, the fictional son of the real Thamesmead couple Jim and Shirley Aidy, who were key figures in the birth of the football club. We had a lady on the football team in last year. Did you play football? Yeah, have a go. I've got anything. Really? That's yeah. great. I reckon I can play a lot better than a lot of these men here anyway. Anything going. We would get involved in We would we get could. involved because like, the football club needed footballs because they had so many teams. Oh, right. So one of the first things I used to say to the film company 
was, we'll do it, but give us some footballs. It's the first time we got any real support on Saturday, Sal. Smashing. You and the gang really made the right noise. <laughs> I reckon we'd have lost without your support. Well, we thought it was a documentary to start off with, but we didn't know we had to do all that acting going, did we? I feel a ref. <laughs> the likes of the girl and the boy, obviously, are professional actors. But with the likes of us, it's, yeah, all right, mate. Now I go to Woolwich because we get a ride in the car. Hello, and it again. Terrible drag on the bus, oh, isn't it? It is a drag. It's definitely a drag. Oh, yeah. Hello, Jim. Hello. Hello, love. How's the For the adults in the early days, Thamesmead was no adventure playground. It was missing many essential services, and the residents had to fight to get them. The population who came in in the early days were quite a vibrant population of people. They, they were described as pioneers, and they really did have quite a pioneering spirit. And I think they sort of rose to the challenge of moving to this new place. Thamesmead's first place of worship was the ecumenical Church of the Cross. You'd never know it was a church if it wasn't for the cross. Well, it's more like a community centre anyway. Everything goes on there. Patrick Forbes was a team vicar based at the church. He moved to Thamesmead from Somerset with his wife and 18-month-old baby and settled at 4 Coraline Walk, right next door to the Gooches. We came in... 1969, I think we were among the first 20 families and uh, my wife certainly said it was like landing on the moon without a life support system and she was right. Patrick appears in Living at Thamesmead in the two roles that he played in the town. First of all, as the vicar. That was me playing the guitar. Good heavens. <laughs> they must have been hard up. And then later he reappears as the community campaigner. It's me. You didn't recognise me, did you? There's Jim Aidy, there's um, Jim Murray, Don Billis. All of us who were here in those very early years had to really flog our guts out, making up for deficiencies in, in if you like, community provision. We fought for everything that we wanted, like not just the football club, youth clubs. Setting up of play groups, fighting for community facilities. The transportation was always an issue. Shops. We've been told this is a town of the 21st century. Where are the shops? The schools weren't big enough to accommodate the numbers of children. To fight for what they needed, the residents banded together as a community association. A residents association has been formed and meets regularly to discuss problems to do with housing, general facilities and social matters. The GLC itself was instrumental in getting the tenants to set up their own independent association with obvious benefits to both tenants and council. I suspect that once or twice in the years that followed they wish they hadn't because the, necessarily the Tensory Community Association had to become an irritant on certain issues. In one of their most successful campaigns they managed to persuade the GLC to fix leaks in the flats. If you've been moved to the promised land and actually your house, your maze net, your flat lets the rain in, uh, it's, it takes the icing off the, the cake a bit. We made use of the fact that it was an extraordinarily interesting place for official visitors to be trailed round. And so eventually we were driven to uh, print A1 posters saying, I've got damp in huge red letters and we distributed them, I think, overnight, one night. It was like a rash all over Thamesmead of these red notices in all the windows saying, I've got damp. So this became a huge embarrassment. And they moved in, they took over a, a maze net or a flat and moved in a team of scientists and technicians and engineers to sort it. Nothing else had worked, polite notes, meetings, even threats of legal action, none of those had done the business, but this is what got them going. It was an amazing bit of community action, very successful, I think. But it should never be thought that Patrick and the other early pioneers at the Community Association just spent their time complaining and fighting. It was the same group of people who created the initiatives and traditions that bound the town together. One of the huge needs really early on was good information and uh, Originally I started this little grisly thing called Mesmedath, which as you really quickly understand is an anagram of Thamesmead. 
And that was so dreadful, we turned it into a properly produced sort of regular monthly thing called Insight. Insight was produced by volunteers and given free to all Thamesmead residents. Under an experimental scheme, Patrick then set up Thamesmead's local radio station, InSound. And one of the most enduring things that Patrick initiated was the Thamesmead Town Show. Thamesmead didn't have a history, so we had to invent history and traditions very quickly. Uh, <laughs> the Town Show was one such event. It was just basically a very ginormous fate for all the uh, voluntary organisations to show what they did to raise money for good causes and, and the like. And it was something that he felt was important that there should be a celebration that took place every year that would bring everybody together. Patrick's idea of creating a tradition worked. The town shows continue to run every year. The Trust Thamesmead Summer Festival is its current incarnation. Its concept is still the same, it's just its scale has changed and it's still the one time when everyone can celebrate Thamesmead as a place. But in 1978, Patrick finally left Thamesmead. It was a period of my life, nine years, when it felt like, work, felt like working round the clock. You know, if you were up to your ears in this place, there wasn't much time for anything else, really. And so it's, it was draining, it was exhilarating, and uh, a great place to have had anything to do with, I think. Thamesmead has always been a political football, and never more so than when Ken Livingstone's GLC went head to head with Margaret Thatcher's new Conservative government in the early 80s. The town was hit hard. In 1981, the GLC's budget for housing was reduced from 500 new builds to just 17. And the town was stranded without a river crossing or a town centre. Well, the dogs chase the postman, the school bell has rung. Private investment kick started a new era of building, but the look of the new housing bore no relation to the original master plan. The Thames Barrier had reduced the flood risk, allowing more traditional homes to be built. This ad is the last Thamesmead film in the LMA's archive. Shot in the dying days of the GLC, it shows a new Thamesmead, without a single shot of concrete, walkways or high-rise buildings. Haven't you ever wanted a patch of your own? A breath of fresh air and room for your family to grow? That's why the GLC got together with people like these to build Thamesmead. Everything you ever promised yourself without giving up friends and neighbours. In the 1990s, after years of involvement in the community and local politics, Jim and Shirley Aidy left Thamesmead for good. Best 20 years of my life on Thamesmead, but there comes a time where it ain't going to get no better. Yeah. And we decided to leave. Nowadays, Thamesmead is home to about 34,000 people. It has a town centre and decent shopping facilities. Transport has improved, but there's still no river crossing. Thamesmead is a town of the 21st century. It's just not the 21st century that the planners were imagining. Most people now live in the more recent developments, but the first stage still stands as a testament to the high ideals of that original master plan. For our next screening, we went to a group of people who've only lived in Thamesmead for a few years. Who's that walking down the street? Oh, there's Tamsa, is she sweet? She's been married twice before. Who's that knocking on Jimmy's Jimmy door? We are there have been brownie packs in Thamesmead since the very early days. My brownie pack was like that when I first took it over here. It, we had that uniform on. It's uh, still the same, but we're just a bit louder and a bit more uh, obnoxious, I think. So, shall we watch the film? Yeah! I can't hear you. Shall we watch the film? Yeah! Perfect. And lights.
I was surprised actually because I wasn't sure how they would feel watching it. I was actually surprised they sat still enough to watch it. And I was very impressed with the questions that they came up with. Strangers that they didn't know. Who were? Those big teenagers. No. Like that little kids that they didn't know. Oh, let's fix it. What are you doing? Soon fix that. Most of the children know most of the people here. They're quite friendly, although we are, you know, you have to obviously drum into the children, be aware of strangers. But what did it tell you about where they lived? Was it like a safe place or was it not a safe place? It was a safe place because loads of people were going outside by themselves. Most of them I've known since they were babies, or I've known their family, or what have you. Hands up if you, what, if you the community want. is wonderful. Everybody knows everybody. If you don't know somebody, you see a new face, and you recognise them again, you make conversation with them, and it's, it's lovely. I love living in Thamesmead. Eyes, focus, focus, eyes, focus. When you saw all those children playing in the paddling pool and the sand pit and everything like that, did you think it looked like good fun? So where's the paddling pool now? Um, at the Tenth Leisure Centre. What do you think of the leisure centre? Um, have, you can swim in the big pool and the little pool. And then there wasn't no water slides that we could see when we were looking at the video. From the film, from what you saw, do you think it looked better then or is it better now? So if you think it was better in the past, put your hands up. Hands up if you think it's better now. Well, lots of people. Very interesting. I think most people think it's better now, which is really nice. These girls seem to have a very positive uh, image of their own community. And what's interesting is when you compare it with older groups who all prefer it how it was in the past. And that's a lovely vibe to get from any community that you visit. If the children are having a good childhood, then uh, you feel good about the world. Science investigator and discovering faith. One, two, three. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't ignore the fact that there are serious social issues in Thamesmead. For four decades, the town has had a reputation for being a crime hotspot. When the early planners designed the town with pedestrians and traffic on different levels, they didn't consider the opportunities that this would present for street crime. They built a town full of dark alleys and empty parking lots. Many of the walkways have gone and the Tavy Bridge area is being redeveloped, but the town has not shaken its reputation. While we were shooting this film, the Thamesmead Summer Festival was closed early because of a disturbance, and a report on the BBC branded Thamesmead the fraud capital of the UK. Interestingly, when these stories were reported in the press, the image that they chose to accompany them was not of Thamesmead today. It was a still from the one film that has been the unshakable reference point for the town. In 1971, Stanley Kubrick shot his notorious science fiction classic, A Clockwork Orange, in the town. I would see that as almost the sort of the tragedy of Thamesmead that it ever was filmed there, because had it not been, I think Thamesmead would have enjoyed a different kind of reputation over time. Thamesmead will forever be remembered as the backdrop for ultra-violent youth gangs, and that association can rub off on the people of the town. We arranged a screening at TYAP, the Thamesmead Youth Awareness Project, which is based in the shopping parade on Tavy Bridge. TYAP is a thriving youth scheme, which offers music projects, support and advice for the young people in the town. So does this music make you think of Thamesmead? No. Okay. Oh my god.
Oh my god. I was busy, bro. Wow. Are you oh, sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. I look at puzzle, bro. Hey, oh, oh, need to look, look there's more. Oh, Davey was bad, bro. Why did they lock it down, man? What's wrong with these P7 drowned? Table. There's someone in the back. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. What's your immediate reaction to what you just saw? It's changed. Big time. Environment, everything's changed, like the people, yeah, society, so, everything. If you look outside now, yeah, some things have been knocked down, but all the flats look exactly the same. Mm. Like nothing has been, I don't even know if they've even put, yeah, they probably put a few paint on yeah. it. That's about it, but everything else is the work, same, and that's work. like how many years ago? Mm. Should have upgraded, man. You can't just stay back in them times. Goodbye. Hello. The film ends with them Can going I help to put you? their name down for a flat. Now, is, is that likely, are you likely to do that? Put our names down for a flat in Thamesley, that's what. It's not that easy to get a house. The only really way to get a house quick time is to get pregnant and fuck that. Mm. Yeah. That bare, bare yeah. chicks now yeah. having yeah. babies yeah. to get yeah. yards in yeah. it. The young people from TEP are a long way from Chirpy Tom and Sally in living at Thamesmead. And it's clear that as the town has grown, tension has developed between the community who moved here in those early days and the more recent arrivals. Because the adults blame us, innit? Even the ones that are doing the crimes, they're still blaming us too. So, yeah, scapegoats. Like, you see, like, when you go to them old people home things, yeah? They will get on well good in there because they're just, with other old people, they can do old people things. But they don't like it when they walk up the stairs and there's bare young people sitting there. They get intimidated. Nice to see you. Look after yourself. Bye bye. Tucked between stage one blocks of flats is the age concern Poppin Parlour, the last outpost for Thamesmead's remaining pioneers. What makes the Poppin Parlour is the old people who've lived here ever since this estate was made. The feeling when the strangers walk in here, we have people now come from Bromley and Slade Green, Black Fan, and they come in strictly because the feeling is so nice when they walk in that parlour. 95% of the people who use this parlour live alone. It's the biggest part, I would say, of the community on Tenry for elderly people. I think they loved it. It took them back. You saw old Don there, you know, he's had a stroke. He was one of the originators of this, him and his wife. What I'm concerned with mainly over there is what groups of people are going to move in. Is it going to be families with young children? Is it going to be senior citizens? Or is it going to be disabled? Now I've seen the film and I, rec I recognise him. <laughs> yeah, how long ago? Don, Don, did you recognise yourself? Yeah. I think the films are really worthwhile because they can show the before and after. And yeah, I, th I think it's a marvellous thing to do, you know, keep, keep sort of filming the stages as, as different people come in. Well, I really enjoyed the film, really good. I think this come from the old village arsenal, it was really is marvellous. But, you know, I think most of the people you saw there today do not like the diverse community that we're getting. And it's getting more and more and more every week. And it is killing the community, without a doubt, it's killing this community. I can see that film, I was counting them up, and the, the amount of black people on that film is about right for the average amount of people on the task. It was like only like two black kids in the whole film. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's like two white kids at TV probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it looks nice, like there's no racism, you don't know, like it was back there, everyone was just happy. Yeah. So do, would you say that racism is, is an issue in terms of media at the moment? It is. Yeah. Even whether people want to believe it or not, it is. The white people are moving out, they know why, why they're moving out. They, they don't want to be in a place surrounded by loads of black people. So as people are saying, when black people are moving in, into a certain area, that area will, be, area will be filled with crime and all that. Yeah, yeah there's stereotypes. Yeah, there's a lot of stereotypes so towards black people. Just... So, Obama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to work with the old people here from Bermondsey and Rotherive and Stepney because they're my people. 
But what you're looking at, if you're finally looking for a community, then you're looking at it right now, within this, oh, yeah, within this, this orbit, a, because uh, we are the people that came here at the start. Yeah. They do not come from the same no. background as I do. Right. We have nothing in, com in, in common no. with one another. They're not prepared to mix in, are they? Yeah. Cultures, yeah. you know, yeah. different cultures, they don't yeah. mix in. We don't have anybody come here, do we? No. They want to be with their own. You know, we want to be with our own, they want to be with our own. It's as simple as that. And everybody coming through that tunnel, I always thought, oh, we're going to end up with rabies in this country. Oh, no, different sort of rabies. We've got no chance. What do you mean, we? <laughs> we, the indigenous people, have no chance. What do you mean? The white. White people? Yes. Oh, I see. It's not the same thing, though, is it? In my book, it is. Oh, it's not in my book, I'm afraid. There are some things you're never going to change, and you're never going to you're never going to be able to challenge someone's views if you don't agree with them um, about things like racism and so on. But um, uh, I just I find that quite saddening sometimes. I find it very sad that the people in the Poppin Parlour feel that the spirit of the old community has left Thamesmead. In the early days, the community association organised welcoming committees for everyone who moved into the town. I can't help but feel that the spirit may have just left them. The town has suffered in many ways over the years. But now, just as at every stage in its history, there are dedicated groups of people who are working for the same goals that the original residents' association fought for. Community cohesion and good facilities for the people who live in the town. Trust Thamesmead is the largest organisation working for the community. It has grown into what it is today, from a seed that was sown by Patrick Forbes in 1976. Trust Thamesmead now looks after community development and community services, and in essence it does many of the jobs that the early groups did when the town was so much smaller. As Jack and Charmian Saywood's films toured Thamesmead, they provoked a multitude of reactions. But most importantly, they encourage people to think and talk about the place that they call home. But how will people see Thamesmead in the future? We invited the people that we met at the various screenings and to help create a short film that could represent Thamesmead in 2009. Unfortunately, some people were unable to make it. Barry Stokely had tickets to see Chelsea play Manchester United. And sadly, nobody from TAP turned up. We later learned that there had been a murder just outside their facility, which several of the young people had witnessed. A very group of people did turn up. Jim Aidy, Robert Moore, who has been here longer than Thamesmead has, Jean and Lillian from the Poppin Parlour, and the 5th Abbey Wood Brownies and Rainbows. Yay! Exactly. We all watched the old films again, and had animated discussions about what they'd like to show and what story they'd like to tell. With another group of people, we'd have made a very different film. The Brownies overwhelmed the workshop with their positivity and enthusiasm, and in a way, it's a very warm and happy film for the future of Thamesmead. This is their film. Come on, Tom. You'll be late for your own funeral. All right, all right. Are you sure we can't take the bus? It's an awfully long way. Stop being so lazy. Anyway, it wouldn't be the same. Hello, Jim. All right, Dad. Looking well. <laughs> So you're finally going to do it then? Yes, I really think we are. Well, it feels right. Kids have grown up, left home, it's just the two of us now, and it seems like we're ready for a new stage in our lives. It would be nice to know you supported us in our decision. Then. Oh, we'll support you without no doubt about that, but I think Shirley might feel a bit strange. Mum, oh, she'll get used to it. <laughs>
Hello. Hello there, Tabitha. What are you up to? Feeding the geese. There's loads this time of year. You know, you remind me of someone I know. Who's that? Your grandma. Nothing she likes better than traipsing around the countryside on nature trails. Still do. You just don't take me anymore. <laughs> so what are we doing now? Oh, this isn't exactly what I call a nature trail. <laughs> go on, off you go. See you later. See you later. Do you remember the times we used to do that? Happy <laughs> days. <laughs> Didn't you fall in once? Was I pushed? Ooh, I don't know about that. Was. Your mum was in the cross. Yeah. <laughs> Not for the first time. <laughs> You'll catch a cold. <laughs> this is fine. Oh, look at it. The amount of times you left me stranded up there waiting for you to arrive. <laughs> I know everyone complained about it when it was here, but. Still sad to see it go. Won't be like this for long, though. Come on. <laughs> I really miss our first flat sometimes. Do you remember, this used to be the only place an unmarried couple could get a flat together. Yeah, but only if both families lived here, remember? Not like it is nowadays. <laughs> We're absolutely sure. <laughs> I'm not going to go that way. Hello, Sally. Hello, Tom. How can I help? Well, the thing is, John, Tom and I have been living together now for, what, 36 years? And we've been together for longer than that. And I... We... I think it's time we got married. <laughs> <laughs>